So we're going to take questions in a few minutes, okay? Because I haven't been answering much. I've been putting a lot of things out which raise a lot of questions. And I know... Oh, yeah, Thank you, okay. Just as it stops. That's like Paul Harvey said, seeing a bumper sticker and a blonde and a, and a Jeep. Not just another dumb blonde. That bumper sticker was on upside down. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, Heidi's amazing. Do you know what she's doing? Heidi's amazing. It's like, okay, we have about 10,000 people in our tipping point network in the United States. You've got Heidi. I would go with that. <laughs> She's awesome. All right, so this is chronic constipation. Somehow, it went up on inflammatory bowel disease, and it came down on constipation. This is a death due to intestinal infection. This is hospital discharge and peritonitis. This is obesity. This is rheumatoid arthritis. And this is children's diagnosis with celiac disease in an Alberta Children's Hospital correlated with the introduction of GMO canola, which is largely Roundup Ready. Okay? Pretty significant. Huh? Well, yeah, it's Canadian oil that's been... For Canada oil is low acid. Right. So, what we have is similar categories of diseases shared by lab animals, described as getting better in humans, some in this room, uh, not, the, not the lab animals in this room, the humans in this room. Um, the pets, the livestock, and the correlation showing that as the use of GMOs and Roundup increases, there's an increase in these diseases. So the question is, how is it possible that food, or GMOs in particular, can be related to any one of these diseases, let alone most or all? It's a question. Okay? So we're going to look at the two main toxins in GMOs and see if they could explain any or all of these disorders. Now the two main toxins are Roundup, which are added to the Roundup ready crops, and then there's the Bt toxin, which is produced by corn and cotton plants. But before we go into the two toxins, I want to describe one other cause or potential cause of problems. And that is the process of genetic engineering in general. Now, when you are crossing species, as they've done for centuries, that's called sexual reproduction. When you are doing genetic engineering, let's say you want to create a corn plant that produces its own insecticide. So you take the gene from soil bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt. By the way, have any? Have any farmers or gardeners used Bt on their crops? Okay, so two or three. So you take, that's a natural bacteria in the soil. You take the gene out of that bacteria, make millions of copies, put it into a gun, shoot that gun into a plate of millions of cells, hoping that some of those genes make it into the DNA of some of those cells. Then you clone those cells into a corn plant. Now every cell in that corn plant has a gene-sized spray bottle that produces Bt toxin. Now the process of insertion, whether done by gene gun or bacterial infection, plus cloning, it's a lot of things, but it's not sexual reproduction. And it produces massive collateral damage in the natural functioning DNA. There could be hundreds or thousands of mutations up and down the DNA. What does that mean? Well, DNA, produces RNA, produces proteins. Now, in Monsanto's BT corn, there's a gene that's normally silent in corn that was accidentally switched on that produces an allergen called gamazine. So if you are allergic to gamazine, you might have a reaction from Monsanto's corn based on something that was never supposed to be in there. It's not evaluated by Health Canada. It's not evaluated by the FDA. It wasn't even evaluated by Monsanto. It was found years after the BT corn was on the market. 
for Monsanto's soybeans, there's as much as a seven-fold increase in a known soy allergen called trypsin inhibitor, which might create allergic reactions in a wide variety of foods. This was known by Monsanto, but they decided to leave it out of their 1996 published study on Roundup because it might have interfered with the conclusion that there was no significant difference between GM soybeans and non-GM soybeans. It was later discovered in the archives of the Journal of Nutrition and made public. There's also lower protein and lower hash and lower essential amino acids, all sorts of ch changes, including a doubling of an anti-nutrient in the soy, which can block the absorption and assimilation of nutrients. So, just the process of genetic engineering alone, just the process, could be responsible for allergens, toxins, carcinogens, anti-nutrients, all sorts of changes in the plant that could result in many or all of these things. It's a wild card. But the regulatory agencies do not evaluate. In fact, the FDA was the first to go on record with its amazing policy. I use the word loosely. Their policy from 1992 claimed that the agency is not aware of any information showing that GMOs were significantly different. And because they, were the, they searched high and low, do you see a difference? Do you see it? Couldn't find a difference. Therefore, we don't care about GMOs. We will let Monsanto determine if its foods are safe and allow Monsanto, who told us that Agent Orange was safe, who told us that DDT was safe, who told us that PCBs were safe, who got convicted of lying about the toxicity of their products, fined $700 million. We will let them decide if their GMOs are safe. They don't even have to tell the FDA if they're going to introduce a GMO. And they don't have to tell consumers either because there's no required labeling. So no required testing, no required labeling. This is the policy of the Food and Drug Administration. Now, documents made public from a lawsuit six or seven years after that policy became public revealed that the entire FDA policy and government policy was based on a lie. Not just a kind of exaggeration, but a fiction. The agency's own scientists, the overwhelming consensus of the FDA scientists who were mandated to evaluate GMOs was exactly the opposite of what was reported in the policy. They said GMOs were not only different but dangerous and could create allergens, toxins, new diseases, nutritional problems. They had repeatedly urged their superiors to require long-term study. But the FDA had been told by the Bush administration to promote GMOs. So they created a new position specifically for Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney. Placed him in charge of policy. It was his policy that gave Monsanto free reign. And then he went to the United States Department of Agriculture, and then he went to Monsanto to work as their vice president. And now he's back at the FDA as the United States food safety czar in the Obama administration. That's the U.S. government. Now, Health Canada is different. Not much better, though. <laughs> Definitely not much better in this regard. It's not, it has basically abdicated responsibility. As those who have studied the approval process, it's based on assumptions, not real science, and many of the assumptions have been disproved years and years ago. Here's one example. BT, those of you who've used BT, uh, do, you, do you remember the can? Remember what it says in the can? Does it say use the mouthwash? It says do not take internally. BT toxin, it washes off and biodegrades once you spray it on very quickly. But in itself, they claim, go to Health Canada website, it has a history of safe use in farming and only affects certain types of insects because it's an insecticide, it breaks over the stomach to 
kill them, but it has no effect on humans or mammals. They entirely ignore peer-reviewed published studies. They entirely ignore the fact that farm workers have gotten an immune response from BT, identified in studies, that mice get an immune response from BT, and organ damage, or tissue damage, in these small intestines. In fact, the science advisory panel of the Food and Drug Administration looked at the mouse studies and the farm worker studies and said, there's evidence of, of allergenicity and, and immune system problems. It requires further study. The EPA ignored the scientific advisory panel, which is the most accomplished allergists and immunologists in the country, and just allowed BT to come on the market. But it gets worse. The BT toxin in the spray form, as I say, is washed off or biodegrades. The BT in the crops is encapsulated and is eaten. But it's also thousands of times more concentrated than the spray form. It's also designed to be more toxic than the spray form. It also has properties of a known human allergen. And so they entirely ignore the science. But when you look at the mice or rats that were fed the BT corn, they're developing immune responses. Serious, widespread immune responses. Now, the BT toxin is supposed to only poke holes in the walls of insect stomachs to kill them. But in 2012, a study showed that it pokes holes in human cells, just like an insect. That's what the study says, just like an insect. So if it pokes holes in human cells, and we're eating it in corn chips, and it's poking holes along the way, that might explain gastrointestinal disorders. So already, immune system problems, BT check. Gastrointestinal disorders, BT check. What if there's actual holes in the gut? That's what it does for insects, where bacteria from the gut can get into the non-gut area. I don't know if they call it bloodstream in insects, and I don't want to make that problem mistake. Get into other places. We only have a, a wall of our intestines one cell thick. When there are holes in it, then things that aren't supposed to be in the bloodstream can get in there. Now when that happens, that's well known and well correlated with Cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, autoimmune disease, inflammation, allergies, and other problems. Here's an example of why. Normally, well-digested proteins get into the bloodstream for use. But if undigested proteins can get in there, they appear as foreign invaders to the immune system. So the immune system, they whip out their iPhone, and they take a picture, or maybe a selfie, no, they take a picture of the foreign invader, and they circulate it to the entire immune system and say, attack anything that looks like that. Now, things that look like that through molecular mimicry are the thyroid organ, the microvilli in the gut, the pancreas. That's called autoimmune disease. When the immune system is circulating a picture of an enemy that's actually itself, because it is mistaken. And one of the very key correlates for autoimmune disease is holes in the intestinal walls, because things get in there to trigger an immune response. So this means that BT toxin, by itself, with no help from Roundup, can explain a rise in all those diseases that I just described that are linked to leaky gut. But if we look at Roundup, uh, actually, let's not look at Roundup just yet. When you poke holes in the walls of the intestines, not only do undigested food proteins get in there, Roundup gets in there, gut bacteria gets in there, and BT toxin gets into the blood. BT toxin itself gets into the blood. According to a mouse study, BT toxin exposed to their, mouth, their blood caused toxicity of the red blood cell. So it was cytotoxin. In Sherbrooke, in eastern Canada, they found BT toxin in the blood of 93% of the pregnant women tested. And 80% of their unborn fetuses. So now we have a BT toxin in the blood of unborn fetuses, where there's no blood-brain barrier developed yet 
So that means that circulating Bt toxin might end up in their brains where it might poke holes in human cells for this generation. Now, if Bt toxin is in the blood, it should wash off fairly quickly. That's what I'm told by scientists who know these things, that the toxin should not stick around and circulate very long. But 93% of the pregnant women and two-thirds of the non-pregnant women have Bt toxin in their blood. This is not Mexico, where they eat corn tortillas every day. Most of the corn products that are eaten by Canadians are highly refined, high fructose corn syrup, or other issues that don't have any more Bt toxin in them. So they could not figure out, on the face of it, what the source was for so many people to have Bt toxin in their blood. They speculated that the Bt toxin was from the milk and meat of animals that eat the Bt corn as part of their daily diet. And that somehow the Bt toxin was stored in the animal, survived the digestion of the animal, and then survived digestion of the human, and then poked holes in the walls of the stomach, perhaps, jumped through those tunnels, and ended up in the blood of pregnant women. That is their speculation. No research has been conducted to verify or not, or not verify that. However, there's an alternative explanation, which I think may carry more weight. It was not mentioned in their study, but I think you'll find it interesting, and I use the word carefully, interesting. In 2004, there was a study to evaluate a claim by the biotech industry that genes were destroyed during digestion. They claimed that genes were destroyed during digestion and said, FDA scientists, you who are worried about genes transferring from genetically engineered crops into gut bacteria, shouldn't worry about it. They were worried about the antibiotic resistant marker gene which is used in most GMOs, what happens is you shoot the gene, you basically shoot the gut into the other cells, right? Now you have a million cells there, let's say, you have no idea which ones have got the genes integrated into their DNA. So you have to figure out which ones, and only a very few have it. So you spray it all with antibiotics, and you kill all the cells, except the very few that have the antibiotic-resistant marker gene. It's not just the Bt gene in there, it's also an antibiotic resistant marker gene in there that is designed to keep those cells alive at that point and that point only. So that you only end up with a handful of cells that you clone into crops. It's called a marker. It selects which ones are now transformed. These are the terms. But it's only used for that one change and it ends up inside every cell of every plant on millions of acres. If you ask the FDA, what do you think of using an antibiotic resistant marker gene in genetically engineered foods, they wrote in their memo, you can find it on our website in all capital letters, it would be a serious health hazard. Can anyone guess why? They'd be resistant to the Right. Because once it's, it, it's designed to be resistant to an antibiotic, and if it transfers to gut bacteria and mates with pathogenic bacteria, that bacteria will be, could be unkillable with that same antibiotic. And they said already antibiotic resistant diseases are runaway. They are linked to amputations and early death and all sorts of problems. So they were very, very against it, but they were overruled, told they were told, don't worry, genes are destroyed during digestion. Just like Bt toxins. So they decided to test it, and this was published in Nature Biotechnology in February 2004. It was a brilliant study. They took seven human volunteers. They had their lower intestines removed. They had an elastomy bag. So they had their lower intestines removed, not for the study. <laughs> it's for science. <laughs> no, it's in the moon. So they, they, they fed them a soy burger and a soy milkshake genetically engineered soy, and they looked inside the elastomy bag, and they were surprised to find how much intact genetically modified soy had survived passage through the stomach and small intestine. 
But in three of the seven volunteers, before they were fed the meal, inside the DNA of the bacteria living inside their gut was part of the gene that Monsanto scientists had found in the chemical waste dump near their factory that they then put into Roundup Ready soybeans and transferred. So at some point before they showed up, this was in the UK, and they don't eat a lot of GM soy in the UK, but three of the seven had gut bacteria that had integrated part of the Roundup Ready gene, and that the gut bacteria was unkillable with Roundup, suggesting that the gene that had transferred was, was producing genetically engineered 24-7, non-stop. Now that in itself could be a problem because those proteins have properties of a dust mite allergen. So if you're allergic to dust, you might also be allergic to the Roundup Ready protein that you might be continuously triggered. But this was a UK-funded study, UK government-funded study, and they had already proved their pro-GM uh, bias when they trashed another researcher that they had given money to. The person accidentally found out that GM was were dangerous and he was fired and gagged and, and beaten up post time, up by post time. So the UK government withdrew all funding for future research into this gene transfer phenomenon, frustrating the scientists who I spoke to on the phone, and never looked to see if the BT corn genes also transferred to gut bacteria. Imagine eating a corn chip. Anyone here eat a corn chip? Admit it now. Last chance. Imagine eating a corn chip or corn on the cob that makes BT toxin. Imagine the gene transferring to your gut bacteria and converting it into living pesticide factories, producing BT toxin 24-7. That might explain why 93% of the pregnant women tested in Canada had BT toxin in their blood, because they are producing it in their guts.